Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about my project, um, which is um, Spectra. Uh, it's an open source biomedical imaging design. One of the things that motivated me to do it was I was thinking about um, the personal computer um, and how that changed computing. Uh, once upon a time, we had these giant room-sized things, um, and they shrunk to a desktop size. Then they became smaller and in everybody's hands so that everybody became programmers and started hacking. Now we have these things in, in the palm of our hand. And when you look at an MR, MRI machine on the left, um, it's really big. Um, it's got its own helium quenching chamber, which you can't see in that picture, just to say it takes up even more space than that. Um, and it's mul multiple millions of dollars. And on the right, this is the tricorder from Star Trek. Wouldn't that be nice? Just, I don't know. So it would be so cool if medical imaging was easily accessible to everybody. We could think of all new ways of implementing healthcare from a preventative standpoint. Right now, people very rarely get an MRI as a preventative measure. They only get it um, when something has seriously gone wrong. Um, if you're in a developing country, you're never going to get an MRI. They don't have any access to medical imaging. Um, obviously, I can talk about the operating room um, and say that the US on healthcare is very expensive for what you get, and there's some kind of problem in how we're innovating in technology, and that's moving through to healthcare. I think we should be very, I'm, I'm trying to, um, I think we should be very careful and safe at all times. But there, I would love to, there to be a safe way that we can also innovate, hack, and improve at a faster rate so that we can enjoy better health. So today I'm going to talk about biomedical imaging, um, uh, electrical impedance tomography, which is the technique that I've implemented, and the open EIT project, um, and applications in the developing world and possible next steps for it. So um, there's like four main existing imaging modalities, the MRI, the CAT scan, the ultrasound, and um, EEG is not an imaging modality, um, but we use it in clinical settings all the time. They have different pros and cons, and I just want to emphasize that one kind of biomedical imaging is not the same as another one, and they're each good at different things. And that's really important to remember when you're sort of trying to find, you know, what, what is the, the hammer for this nail. Um, there's the CAT scan, which is um, ionizing radiation, which means you don't want to get too many of them, otherwise you'll get cancer. It's a few million dollars. Um, it has low contrast resolution, so it's not good with soft tissue, but it's good with bones. An MRI um, gets really good spatial resolution, but really bad time resolution. An ultrasound um, is good for soft tissue, um, but it has a scattering problem. And it's 115K on average, um, which is definitely more um, pro like cost effective than an MRI or a CAT scan. And then you've got EEG, which doesn't do imaging, but it has great time resolution. Um, so these different modalities are good for different applications. So on the left, um, something like I said, I've got time resolution versus spatial resolution just to show two axes and a few different things that can go wrong with you to say what kind of um, thing needs what kind of t time resolution or spatial resolution. So you can see that different ailments need a different sensor or a different modality to detect them and diagnose them properly. As I mentioned, CAT scans are bad for you. Avoid them unless you really need them. So I'm going to talk about this, this different modality, electrical impedance tomography. Um, which is a kind of research technique which uses very small AC currents. So the way that it works is that um, current flow, if you send an AC current uh, through a medium, um, will take different routes dependent on the frequency um, that, you, that you shine through it. And that's really interesting because if you shine these AC currents through at different angles, they'll take these different routes and then you can uh, move that around, and this thing over here on the left, that's a, we call that a phantom in biomedical imaging, which just means something that's outside the body that you use to do tests with, like a, it's conductive, like the body, so it, typically a tank of water with some, uh, some fruit and vegetables in it. And as you can see here, 
um, by running these counts across, we can recreate an image of where the fruit are. Um, so electrical impedance tomography has been used for lung volume measurements, muscle and fat mass measurements. You could do gestural recognition with it, um, bladder and stomach changes, breast and kidney cancer detection, hemorrhage detection. Um, and another a few interesting papers include uh, looking at depth of anesthesia um, and action potentials, which is the neuroscience angle. Um, it's non-invasive, it's non-ionizing, compact, inexpensive, has much better source localization than EEG, and good time resolution, two milliseconds is possible, so good for functional imaging. It's not well known. Um, and, you know, the spatial resolution um, is limited by the number of electrodes used and the inverse problem. So it's not a perfect technique. It doesn't get as good spatial resolution as a CAT scan. So um, just to sort of go back to the first MRI scan, this is an MRI scan of a thorax, so a cross section um, through the ribs. Um, and that's what we have now. That's actually my brain from back when I was an uh, MRI technician. <laughs> um, and then this is an early EIT scan of the same thorax region of the lungs. So the question for EIT is what's next and how much we can improve it. So the Open EIT project um, is an open source um, firmware, PCB design, software, hardware, Python dashboard, reconstruction algorithms set up. Um, and you can, you can go to it right there. Um, and the way that it works is that you send these currents through at these different angles, and um, there's a test setup of an orange, um, and you use the, the back projection method, um, which uses a radon transform form to create a sinogram of the, the object, so um, the current deviates, or the impedance value at the, the other end of the, uh, at the receive electrode will be different when an object is in the way. Then you do an inverse radon transform. Um, the same thing that you, you can see in OpenCV. I, the first time I tried to make an algorithm with this, I used OpenCV, which is an open source image processing library. Then I moved to a, a specific EIT library after that. So um, this is what the system looks like. Um, it's two inches square. I, d I brought it with me, and I can show it to people afterwards. Um, and um, yeah, it attaches to a tank or your body or like an electrode um, array to put around your ribs. And I'll show you a picture of my thorax in a little bit. Um, you're probably wondering about safety. Um, so there's a set of safety guidelines um, called IEC 60601-1. Um, yeah, and um, it's within those, um, which is nice. Not to say that you can't get better results if on fruit, specifically if you have higher current levels, but that's okay. Um, this is what the dashboard looks like. Um, it does a few different things. It does the imaging, um, which I, I like, which is the, the basic sort of wow. You can do biomedical imaging um, in in a really portable, small way, very cheap way. Um, it does spectroscopy and um, also gathers time series data. Um, so this is like an example of how it works. So I've got a tank um, with a cup on it and I'm moving the cup around and I can, I'm localizing where the cup is only through um, current. So this is just to show, wow, look, yep, you can do that. Here's, here's another picture of that. Um, I don't know, this is me rotating Oops. Um, I can do this. So I've got a shot glass. Um, and this is just with eight electrodes. You get better resolution with 32, by the way. Um, and I'm just rotating it around. Um, and so you can see that I'm picking up where, where that is. Um, so that's just to sort of show you how it works. Something else you can do with it is um, gestural control looking at how the muscles move inside the arm. Um, so there's a whole lot of different applications you could do with it that relate to first world medicine. Um, but the, the, the message I want to get across is that anybody can improve biomedical imaging and maybe it's a worthwhile thing to do. And that's a picture of my shed or where I was busy doing this. 
And there's a picture of my lungs um, made in my shed. So this isn't, um, I'm, this is not GE. This is a little smaller than that. Um, so just a reminder of the first MRI scan and the current MRI scan, early EIT scan. So what's really cool about it, wow, that turned out interestingly, um, <coughs> um, is um, so up the top you've got an apple, a sweet potato in a tank, and um, on multiple days I measured them at different AC frequencies, and as you can see, um, the sweet potato has a different spectrum than an apple, has a different spectrum than a water. And then I created a simple classifier, it's very simple, um, just to identify where one thing is and the other thing is. So I know where a sweet potato and apple is in a tank. Why that's important is let's just move that to tumors or a bullet or um, um, a bone, fat mass, muscle mass, um, other changes in the body that you want to measure. So this is a stationary picture. You can also measure those changes in time. Um, so you might ask, what's the, the height of this technique? What's the best people have got? Well, um, the spatial resolution they've got on a rat is 200 microns um, at two milliseconds time resolution. Um, that's, that's pretty good. Um, that's enough to see um, action potentials or neuronal depolarization which is like a holy grail of, of neuroscience or functional neuroimaging. Um, and they've been able to do that um, using an ECOG array on the cortex of a rat in 2016. Um, and the, the name of the person who was first over on paper is Kirill Obristovich. Um, but you might ask about the medical, like, like great applications now. Um, so four billion people don't have any access to medical imaging. It would be neat if they, they had some access. Um, and maybe the re spatial resolution doesn't even have to be that high to actually be useful for them. Um, so tuberculosis is a big problem in the, in the developing world. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, different techniques for different ailments. Um, so what's a low-hanging fruit? Maybe pulmonary edema or water on the lungs? Um, so here we have um, breathing in and breathing out, and you can see the um, the lungs expand and contract on the right, and um, they can see water on the lungs and whether one lung is not opening. Um, you can see breathing and a heart rate, which is interesting because it's different from ECG. It's measuring material change through a cross section of body. So, you know, the lungs filling with oxygen and um, exhaling, and for the heart, um, impedance cardiography is different from ECG because what it is, is measuring the, the, the movement of blood flowing through the heart. So it's a different measurement. Um, where can we go from here to make it better? Um, so, you know, right now it's this small thing. It's IEC compliant, it's Bluetooth enabled. Um, if you want to help out, there's a website. Um, I don't know what happened to the top here, but. Um, so um, more electrodes give more resolution, um, but there's a limit to how far you can go with that. You could do cross modalities with different sensors. So put it in a big magnet. Um, that's called magnetic resonance EIT, and there's a lab in Arizona working on that. Um, you could um, replace, instead of just having current, you could put um, uh, infrared light and do sort of a, a, a mix of near-infrared spectroscopy. You could connect little piezos and do an acoustic impedance. Um, so those are just some, some different ideas of different imaging modalities. Very interesting paper on acoustoelectric effect. I'll skip past that. Um, on the algorithm side, um, Machine learning um, and statistics would be great to use instead of the very simplified resistor models. Right now, the cell is modeled as a simple resistor, which it isn't. It's a complex circuit. Um, and if we modeled it the way that it perhaps exists with a, like some capacitance as well, maybe we'd get better results. Um, again, people have only just started using machine learning with this technique. Um, since it's multidimensional, 
you get a dielectric spectrum, like the fruit that I showed, at every point in space. It's very hard to understand visually, because it's got all these dimensions. It would be perfect for machine learning. Mm. Ikogere, haha. <laughs> um, you can improve the time resolution. Um, that's always a good thing to do, so you can get things like action potentials. Um, if you flip the side, um, this, this work is um, by a scientist called Nia Grossman, um, who's doing it in the opposite direction to, to write non-invasively using beat frequencies. So he's sending two currents at slightly different frequencies that overlap to create a beat frequency at a specified location in space that he can very carefully move around. Um, which is very interesting because that oscillation that he can carefully move around, he's shown causes uh, neurons to oscillate as well. So he can basically stimulate neurons at a specified location in space, non-invasively. And Neil Grossman 2000, uh, published in Cell 2017, you can look it up. Um, so yeah, so, so there's um, modeling of Maxwell's equations, which could definitely be done better. That's a static model right now, and um, it's not a static problem. So those were some possible next steps um, for this project um, to make biomedical imaging more accessible to more people. Um, I'd like to thank um, some of the open source contributors, particularly Marion uh, LeBorn, Ben Wan, who helped with the algorithms, Clement Yanev, who helped with the flex electrode array, Elizabeth Ricker, John Nolte, Sebastian Rees, Andrew Grosser, and um, Paul Clark. Um, so as a kind of um, then, now, and tomorrow, I'd like to remind people about the barber surgeons. Once hairdressing and being a surgeon was the same thing, and you had a saw and some scissors, and you just chopped off the limbs that were infected and, and you know maybe put something hot to stop the bleeding, and that was it. Now we do keyhole surgery, which is definitely a, a step up in the world. And maybe soon, um, we can do non-invasive bioelectronic um, focused surgeries, and that would just be really wonderful um, and a huge step forward for healthcare in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, yeah, um, I would love you to join the mailing list. Um, I am trying to grow a mailing list to um, eventually do a, a crowdfunding campaign. So that would be a wonderful way um, to, to help and maybe get a kit um, where you can do testing and um, an experiment with biomedical imaging yourself um, and add to it and try different things. And this will help everybody, I think. Um, yeah, so that's my talk. Um, and I'm open to questions and things at the end. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>